we're going to start anywhere, we have to know where we want to end up. Right. So how do treatment goals differ, if at all, by the subtype and, and severity of the disease? Well, when we talk about, you know, the burden of hemophilia, you know, mostly we're thinking about severe hemophilia, which again presents with spontaneous bleeding at a, at a young age. Actually, as it turns out, if the level of residual clotting factor activity exceeds 1%, which is the threshold above which you no longer are considered to have he a severe hemophilia, but instead moderate hemophilia, and then above 5% mild hemophilia, spontaneous bleeding isn't really, you know, that common. It can happen. Uh, but mostly it's experienced with trauma or major surgery, for instance. And it's, so it's really the, the patients with severe hemophilia who are looking at using prophylaxis from a, from a, a very young age. Um, and then that's where we talk about the, the high cost over a lifetime. I just want to pause for a moment because the number, just as a physician, the number you quoted is simply astounding. It's breathtaking. Yeah. If you have 1%, right. 5%. You're okay. To me, that means that, for instance, factor eight and factor nine are very, very important proteins. So nature ensured that we have a whole lot of it around. Yes, over one yeah. percent actually is the target for um, a trough level for prophylaxis. You want to keep that level from ever falling below one percent. If a child wants to play, you know, contact sports or whatever, then that's going to have to change and be higher. But for prevention of spontaneous bleeding, that's the threshold. But that simultaneously answers one question you had mm -hmm. about trough levels. Mm -hmm. But to me, as, as as someone who's been in the doctor trade for a long time, looking at the biology of this, 1% is so small. And that's all it takes. This is a well-designed machine. It takes a lot to break it. Seems like it, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, what are the difference in treatment expectations then between patients and providers? You want to keep it above 1% or 5%. What do the patients want? Well, I think the patients uh, want to, and, and the parents of patients, you know, from the pediatric perspective, want uh, to, to either live normal lives or have their children live, you know, as normal lives as, as possible. Um, you know, that's going to be translated into functional outcomes. Um, and what intersects with that is the ease of administration of the replacement protein. You know, as you mentioned, um, you know, this is an intravenous therapy. You know, you got to place an IV, you mix it up. If you have to do that fewer times per week to achieve the same result, then that would seem to be an improvement. Um, and, and certainly the field is moving that way with, with uh, regard to longer acting proteins. So help me out. There, there's treatment versus prophylaxis. Yes. Um, what are, what are we talking about here? Well, um, prophylaxis, again, refers to prevention of, of bleeding episodes. And for patients with severe hemophilia, it typically constitutes administration of uh, intravenous doses of replacement clotting factor proteins at least once a week. But for children, mostly twice a week up to every other day. And I hear the, the phrase primary and secondary prophylaxis. Yes. What does that mean? Well, secondary prophylaxis is prophylaxis that's given really after an individual has already experienced, um, for instance, the, the onset of frequent episodes of joint bleeding, okay. um, or has undergone a major surgical procedure, um, and then requires uh, therapy to, to prevent bleeding after that procedure. Primary prophylaxis is the entity that describes administration of clotting factor to, to young children. And the difference in advantages, disadvantages between um, long-term, rather episodic treatment versus prophylaxis, is there a difference here? Well, again, you know, for children, uh, the joint outcome study showed that uh, children who were treated with a prophylactic regimen of um, clotting factor, recombinant clotting factor eight concentrate had a six-fold um, lessened uh, frequency of hemophilic uh, joint bleeds than uh, children who were managed with an enhanced episodic administration. Well, that's dramatic. It is, it is. And it must have a long-term impact, obviously, on the joints and everything else. It does, you know, the, the, the individuals who have been doing primary prophylaxis for the longest are really the Swedish, and so they, they've been doing this since the 70s, and they have, um, you know, data that's now decades rich that shows better outcomes in terms of physical activity, mobility, participation in sports, um, you know, quality of life, function, and that, that's, I think, where we want our patient, all of our patients with hemophilia to get to. And are there some agents that last longer, some are shorter acting? Uh, is there a spectrum out there? Well, within the you know, current sort of um, gamut of available therapies, which include plasma-derived as well as recombinant replacement factor eight or factor nine proteins, you know, there, there are subtle differences, um, but, th but they pretty much have you know, similar half-lives. Um, you know, phase three clinical trials have now been completed for some you know, longer acting. Uh, factor eight and factor nine products that will that will hopefully be able to um, extend time between infusions. Uh, so, for instance, a patient with hemophilia B may be able to su successfully infuse for primary pro prophylaxis maybe you know once a week, maybe once every other week.